Discovery webinar for the East Fork Watershed. My name is Mia Brown and I am a planner with the Environment and Development Department at the North Central Texas Council of Governments, uh, but people just know us as COG around here. To give a brief overview of who we are, the COG is a voluntary association of local governments. We are one of 24 COGs in Texas and our main function is to transcend jurisdictional boundaries to promote sound development and facilitate cooperation among our member governments. Uh, before we get started, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar will last one hour or less, and lines will be muted during the presentation, but please feel free to ask questions by utilizing the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. If you have the presentation in full screen mode, you can access the chat box from the top of your screen. Besides myself, we also have two speakers from House Associates today, Jared Overbay and Samuel Otta. On this slide, you will see contact information for us, as well as some additional folks. These people are not speaking today at this webinar, but they are partners from our federal and state agencies that oversee the CTP grant program. These folks include Alan Johnson with the Federal Emergency Management Agency and Manny Rosso and Michael Stegner from the Texas Water Development Board. All of this contact information will be presented again at the end of the webinar. For the agenda for today's webinar, we will begin with an overview of the Risk Map Program, the NCT COG Discovery Activities, and how the discovery process works. We will then discuss the East Fork Watershed and its pre-discovery activities, discovery activities, and post-discovery activities. And finally, we'll talk about our data gathering website and have a walkthrough of how to use it. So with that, I am now going to turn it over to Jared with Health Associates to talk about risk map. Thank you, Mia. So discovery is one step of FEMA's risk mapping, assessment, and planning program. Uh, the risk map program, it's a four-step collaborative process aimed at enhancing NFIP communities' mitigation plan and promoting resiliency. What we mean by it is that since it's an action-driven plan, this is the, what we mean is the end goal is to take this data, is to plan and prioritize mitigation actions. So steps one and two of the risk map program are to ID risk and assess risk. So that means that's where the discovery process will come in, and also following that will be the flood risk identification projects, which means detailed watershed-based H&H map, &H and mapping, and also non-regulatory products such as changes since last firm, areas of mitigation interest, and depth grids. Steps three and four is communicate risk and mitigate risk, and that's where the regulatory defer mapping comes into play. And then also finally um, turning this over to the communities to do capital improvements and flood control projects and mitigation planning. As a FEMA cooperating technical partner, CTP, NCT COG is currently facilitating steps one and steps two, doing the discovery uh, projects and flood risk identification. The risk map program also allows local communities to control which projects are completed through adding leverage in the form of a cash match or pre-existing data. Um, it changes the way that FEMA and local communities are currently interacting. It empowers communities to reduce, flood, uh, to reduce future flood losses through implementing mitigation actions, to reduce your risk by doing mitigation planning and looking for grant opportunities, to ensure your risk through the National Flood Insurance Program, and also communicate effectively about risk. What it does is it puts the communities in the driver's seat to make the final decisions on which projects get funded for that step two um, under the flood risk identification projects. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sam to talk more about discovery. Thank you, Jared. Um, so we're going to continue um, throughout the presentation talking about what discovery is and um, the discovery process for the East Fork watershed and all that we have to do to be able to complete this project. Um, so as we saw on the previous two slides, um, FEMA has this new program called RixMap, and RixMap is focused on local understanding and ownership of risk. And so um, unlike DreamMap mode, where whenever FEMA was going to undertake any project, they will come to the community and say, we are going to change your maps, we have new mapping, um, and then we are going to get everything digital. This time, um, before FEMA comes to do any RixMap project in the watershed, very first phase is going to be what they call discovery. And the whole goal is to get a complete picture of your watershed or your community by working closely with you, the local community, because the focus is on you, the local communities, because you understand the rigs, you take ownership of the rigs, you manage your floodplain um, in your communities, and so you understand where there are issues, challenges, and you are able to manage staff more closely. 
Um, and so what is discovery all about? Um, it, we go through a couple of phases, a couple of um, different um, phases as we go through this project. And so the first thing that FEMA does is they select a watershed. Um, generally, um, they look at population, they look at the needs, um, and then they will look at the availability of new topographic information like new LIDAR, um, whether they will flaunt any new photogrammetric um, contours in the area. Um, they also consider some of the community engagement processes um, that's going on within the watersheds. What are the needs? What are their concerns? Um, do they have um, any mitigation challenges that needs to be um, paid attention to? Um, and then, uh, of course, there's always one a discovery meeting where we actually meet at a location and then, you know, engage within um, with the state, um, with some of the stakeholders within the watershed and try to find out what everybody is working on and how we can collaborate within the watershed so that we have a watershed that is resilient to flooding. And then there's always the post-coordination um, activities where we um, analyze all the data that has been collected during discovery um, and then come up with certain decisions and projects um, for the watershed. Um, and so throughout this presentation, we'll be asking for data um, because discovery, the success of most of the discovery projects is dependent on what kind of data we collect and how we're able to analyze the data for the watershed. Um, and so this is a quick graphic, um, a snapshot of some of the data that we'll be asking for. Um, we'll be asking for data like some of your low water crossings. Um, for example, COG has a website that collects some of this data already, but if you have more information, we'll be glad to collect them. Um, do you have any channelization projects, capital improvement projects? Um, do you have any stormwater um, activities going on um, that you want to share with us? Um, have you identified any streams that you want to have some updated studies on? Um, how is the relationship with your um, stakeholders like the state and FEMA? Um, are you keeping up to date with your NFIP requirements? Do you have questions? Um, do you have questions for grant? And so during the discovery process, it's just not about we um, collecting data from you, but we also want to pay attention to your needs and concerns and be able to document these so that FEMA can put them into their inventory and begin to make plans to address some of these issues that we discover in, within the watershed. Um, so this is another um, graphic for the discovery process. Um, one of the things that we've already done is FEMA and NCT COG have selected this watershed for the East Fork for this project. Um, we're going through the coordination with you all the stakeholders in terms of um, communicating um, newsletters and emails and getting data um, from you. Um, the next phase, um, which takes the most time, is gathering all the data um, that's available within the watershed and then doing what we call um, base level engineering data development, which I will talk about um, in the next few slides. And then we'll also have a, an in-person discovery meeting um, where we all meet. Um, it's going to be a come and go meeting and we'll talk about issues and find ways to collaborate um, better within this watershed. And then there's going to be a lot of post-meeting activities, um, analyzing all the data that have been collected, um, going back and forth with the communities um, to answer issues, concerns. And then we'll have a final report with all the data and then make recommendations to um, NCT COG and FEMA. And so one of the data that will be developed um, during the discovery process is what we call base level engineering. And our old FEMA map mod maps, um, there was a lot of approximate studies that were done. Um, most of these approximate level um, floodplains were based on just USGS old topo. Um, the streams were not matching the topo. Um, and most of these zone A's were basically digitized. Um, and so you see mapping that's not matching topo, it's not model backed. And so FEMA um, came up with this program whereby we can have model backed um, approximate level mapping that also has some form of H&H um, &H models attached to it, but then it also matches the topo within the um, jurisdiction. And so this is a graphic where you see cross sections drawn on the streams in the topo and um, see how some of these models are done. Um, so base level engineering, yeah, it works on a watershed level because it's supposed to be a large scale um, automated um, engineering process. Um, and so usually we look, we look at base level engineering from a HAC 8 um, level. And so 
one of the first things that it's considered, like I said earlier on, when you're looking at base level engineering is, do we have new topographic information? Um, um, the good thing is the East Fork watershed has a lot of new um, light that has been flown um, over the last few years. And so um, that was one of the main reasons why this watershed was um, chosen for base level engineering. Um, and then, of course, there's always because it's model backed, um, we do um, some form of H and H, um, and so there's if there are gauges within the watershed, um, there's sort of some sort of gauge analysis, um, and then regression is used for the hydrology. And so whatever gauge analysis is done is compared to the um, regression, and the flows are adjusted to match. Um, and then there's the models that are developed in RAS. So you have hydraulic models um, backing up um, the the mapping, the final mapping that are shown um, on the on the maps. So what are the outputs um, when we do base level engineering? Um, when base level engineering is done, um, we generally map um, the 25, you know, we look at the 50, the 100, and the 500 year storm events. But after looking at those storm events, the actual mapping that is done is the 10, the 100, and the 500. Um, we map the 10 because in this area we have a lot of flash floods and most of them um, are close to the 10-year floods. And so we want to look at um, how big those flood events are and help floodplain managers within those communities prepare before um, a flash flood occurs. Do you have low water crossings, for example? If you have basic level engineering data, it gives you an idea of the depth of flooding on some of your roads. And so you, you can prepare ahead of time whether those roads need to be closed um, or not. And so base level engineering also gives you an idea of whether your flood plane is changing within your communities. And so we produce a data set called areas of expanded flood rates, where we look at how the flood plane is changing horizontally within um, your community. And so you, you receive a data set where you see maybe places shaded with red or green, where red means, you know, the flood plane is increasing and green means it's decreasing. And then you receive what we call depth and analysis grades. Um, and so whereby the flat plane boundary only shows a line on a map, the depth and analysis grade actually helps you discover that your flood rate actually varies within the flood plane. Um, and so you receive this um, data set so that you can actually click on a map and know the depth of the flood. And instead of um, trying to visualize how a water surface elevation is in relation to a certain datum, it's easy to relate to that, for example, when there's a 10 year storm um, in your community, most um, people who have water in their living room. Um, and then the last thing is the flood risk assessment. Um, as Jera spoke on the earlier slides, one of the goal of the risk map is find ways to mitigate against the risk. And so as we do BLE and mapping and H&H &H and identify the risk, we also want to see some of the consequences of the risk and find ways to mitigate it. And so that's what flood risk assessment does. It looks at the built environment um, in terms of you know, your capital infrastructure, like your buildings, your, um, or the building values, um, the content values, um, some of the commercial properties, and then it looks at when there's a particular storm um, event occurs. For example, how many buildings will be um, destroyed, what are some of the contents that will be uh, put at risk, and how we can plan for shelter needs and stuff like that. And so that is what flood risk assessment does. So BLE is a quick way to be able to do all these um, within, within a watershed and plan um, for um, flood events and find ways to re and create a resilient um, community within the watershed. And, and so when you look at BLE, it provides a quick um, building block in terms of H&H &H models. Um, most communities have zone A mapping. They don't have any models to back those zone A's. And so anytime there's new development, they have to start models from scratch. Um, but then if you have model back zone A's, it becomes, you know, a building block for you where you can use that um, zone A models from BLE and then begin to build upon it um, when you, whenever you have any new development within your communities. Um, it creates a starting point for conversations within flood rates because now that you have areas where it tells you where the flood plane is changing within your jurisdiction, you begin to have conversations with developers, with subdivisions about how they can prepare and make their communities resilient. Um, because everything is automated um, and it's worked on a high grade level, we think it's, it's cheaper um, and it's quicker because it gives you a lot of information um, at a very um, low price. Um, it's faster because of the automation involved. 
Um, and then it gives us a lot of data for review um, because now we have model back information that we can use to compare what is currently shown on our maps and whether it even reflects um, current conditions um, within our jurisdictions. And then it provides a means for us to collaborate within, with other communities, um, whether they are upstream or downstream of the, of the watershed and uh, neighboring communities around because you have you know, community boundaries and you have streams um, crossing other boundaries. And so be, now you are looking at floodplain information not within just a particular jurisdiction but on a watershed level. So a quick overview of some of the activities um, within the East Fork watershed, and then Mia will come and continue, but um, the Corps of Engineers, the hydrologic team, um, the hydrologic hazard team is working on um, a hydrologic study for um, the lakes um, within this watershed. And so their plan is to come up with final discharges um, by the end of September 2019. Um, they are actually planning to have draft results um, this fall um, for um, the public to look at, and then they'll finalize this in September 2019. Um, at the same time, uh, FEMA is also working on studies on the Trinity and the East Fork, um, Trinity Rivers, and what they're also doing is a detailed study on these streams. Um, the plan is to have draft results again in September, and then they are going to use the core um, final results, input them into their final um, h and h and then produce final mapping too for this watershed. Um, and so there's a lot going on in this watershed, um, a lot, there's a lot of new development, and so we want to make sure that this um, development is captured in all the uh, modeling that is taking place so that we will make ourselves resilient to flooding. And so I will hand over to Mia. It's good. Thanks, Sam. Uh, on note with this FEMA study in particular, I wanted to mention that um, the FEMA study of the Eastport Trinity from the portion from Lake Grey Hubbard Dam to the confluence of the Trinity Main Stem, um, which of course is currently a Zone A unstudied stream, I want to mention that this effort is happening in conjunction with an expansion of a long-standing regional program that NCT COD facilitates, which is the Trinity Common Vision Program. If you are one of the communities along that portion of the Eastport, we have reached out to you about this particular effort. However, I did want to note this watershed discovery effort we are discussing today is through FEMA's Cooperating Technical Partners Program and will cover the entire East Fork Trinity watershed. So COG does have a history as a cooperating technical partner. We became a CTP in 2002 and assisted FEMA and the Texas Water Development Board with the map needs assessment in 2009. We began discovery projects in 2013 and those utilized the previous map needs assessment data and they updated it. These watershed discoveries ultimately result in post-discovery projects, also known as flood risk identification projects. And as a few examples, in 2013, the Village Creek study with the city of Kindale came out of the Lower West Fort Trinity discovery and provided new hydraulics and hydrology and mapping for 13 streams. In 2014, the Bear Creek study with the cities of South Lake and Colleyville also came out of the Lower West Fort discovery and resulted in the same products for a substantial number of streams in those communities. In 2015, the Lynchburg and West Irving Creek studies came out of the Lower West Fork and Elm Fork Trinity discoveries, providing the same products for the cities of Irving, Shady Shores, and Corinth. And I point these out because I do want you all to know as you listen to our uh, presentation about the East Fork discovery that when you participate as a community in these studies, uh, there, are, there are flood risk identification studies that result from these. And so I wanted to make sure you all have good examples of that. And so, the Council of Governments will be leading the East Fork Watershed Discovery this year. The overall goals of this process are to provide information through mitigation planning and action, as well as effective risk communication. We also have the goal of gathering information about local flood risks and hazards and current mitigation strategies. And so now we'll discuss the activities that will occur throughout the discovery process. Thank you, Mia. So we're going to discuss um, what some of the activities that have already started um, for the discovery process. Um, you all have received emails. Um, about for this webinar and you receive, um, for example, newsletters um, about um, this particular project. Um, and so what are we asking for? Um, one of the things that we're going to be asking for is geospatial information. Um, what kind of information do you have that will help us analyze flood risks within the watershed? Um, do you have community boundaries? Um, do you have flood study needs? Um, do you have mitigation areas that you've identified? Do you have areas that have a lot of historical flooding? Anytime it rains, it floods that you can pinpoint to us so we can analyze those places um, when we do models within the watershed. Um, do you have, you know, 
watershed plans available or planned um, in the future that you can share with us? Um, do you have parcels and building footprints? Things that we can look at when we are analyzing um, flood related um, information within this watershed. And this is a snapshot of the newsletters that went out. Um, if you didn't receive a copy, you can always contact us and we can send you um, a copy of the newsletter that went out. Um, again, um, we, we are going to be planning uh, meetings in the fall. Um, these are going to be the actual in-person discovery meetings after we've gathered all the data um, that we can um, through a website that I will show you later on. Then we're going to plan an actual in-person um, meeting where we have all the stakeholders coming in and then we'll have a chance to work face-to-face um, -face and discuss flood issues within um, the watershed. And so generally it's a come and go meeting. You come in, um, we have stations set up for the various stakeholders within the watershed. For example, the states will be there, the, um, the federal government, FEMA will be there, um, some of the um, local um, stakeholders like um, the water district will also be there and all the communities that are in the watershed are being encouraged um, to attend and there's going to be stations with computers set up where we'll um, take information from you that you've already identified um, and then put all this in within our database to help with analyzing flood risks on a watershed level within this jurisdiction. Um, here are some pictures of some of the activities that have um, we've done for other um, watersheds. And so you can see um, people talking and looking at maps and um, making drawings on them to capture um, comments about um, issues that people might have um, with um, things within their communities. And so who should come? Who should attend? Um, we encourage um, community leaders, floodplain administrators, um, anybody who does anything related to floodplain. Um, or mapping, um, we encourage them to attend. Um, of course, the federal and state and regional agencies have already been contacted and so they will be there. Um, if you have community leaders who are interested in funding flood um, projects, we encourage you to invite them to attend some of these uh, meetings. Um, and so what do you bring? Um, we ask that you bring as much information as you can. The success of this whole project depends on how much good data we can put in so that we can make good analysis out of it. And so for the most part, we will be calling you, emailing you, and say we need all this information. And so pay attention to your emails when we, we send them out because um, it's going to help us to have a good report and good analysis for this watershed. This watershed has a lot of development going on and we we believe that we have good information and we'll be able to plan for its future needs. And so anything um, that you think can help um, to identify flood risks, communicate flood risks, um, and help with the mitigation activities, please um, add them to your list and send them to us. They can either be in digital or hard copy form and we'll make use of those. Some of the post-discovery activities. Um, so after we've actually done the in-person discovery meetings, at that time we, we were going to assume we've collected more than 90% of the data that we can for the watershed. We'll begin to analyze them um, and then review our findings with NCT COG and FEMA and then create a final report. Um, this report will be publicly available um, for you all to look at um, and then we'll use that to decide on what kind of project um, will have to um, prioritize and do within the East Fork watershed. Uh, again, quickly, this is um, a quick graphic showing us um, the whole discovery project um, from start to finish. Um, and so we've already done the pre-discovery meeting. Um, pre-discovery newsletter has already been sent out. Um, and so we are actually in this phase where we are developing data on all the BLE information that I talked about. Um, and then once that's done, we'll actually have the discovery meeting and then be begin the post-discovery process until we finalize our reports um, and then our prioritizations for projects um, and then complete everything and then submit it to um, FEMA. Um, and so the discovery meetings will be planned in the fall. Um, watch out for emails, venues, and information coming up about these meetings. Um, and then make sure you spread the word around um, when the emails and information come out. Um, and so in a short while, I'm going to go to this data discovery website that we've, we've developed for this project. 
Um, and this is the URL, it's at nctcalldiscovery.hav.com. Um, it's a secured website, and so make sure you enter the entire URL, otherwise it will not pop up on your screen. Um, this is the password to go into the website. Um, you can put in your email address um, as your username, and then just type in the password and it will allow you to log on. Um, this information was also sent out in the email in the newsletter that was sent out um, last week, but if you don't remember it, you can still email us and we'll send that to you. And so I'm going to quickly um, launch the website and I'll walk you through it on how to log on and some of the things that you should pay attention to as you enter data into the website. And so when you type um, the URL, um, this is the home page. Um, the home page just comes on your screen right here with a picture of the um, East Walk watershed. Um, and so you click on find out more um, and then you move on to um, the actual um, pages. And so we have these tabs um, on top of the web page that tracks um, your progress um, as you begin to enter data um, for your community. Um, the home page gives you an idea of you know, why we need help and why we are asking for um, data for this particular project. There's a couple of links on this web page that helps you understand some of the acronyms that you'll be hearing people talk about um, when they're talking about discovery or even some of our FEMA programs. And so once you click on it, and it pops up with some kind of PDF information about um, the acronyms. Uh, and so this is it. Um, it gives you a lot of some of the acronyms that um, people talk about when they are discovering, they are discussing um, BLEs or discovery or some of the FEMA um, things. Um, I'm going to go back to the home page. Um, some of the things that I also talk about are other acronyms related to flood risk um, assessment. Um, and so we've created a shortcut for it. And we'll be talking about things about areas of mitigation interest. And there's a lot of acronyms associated with that too. And so we have a shortcut here too that will help you understand um, some of those um, terms. Um, as you log on to the website and put in more information. And so I'm going to put, um, type an email address um, and then log on to the website. And so let's say um, my email, and then I'm going to type in the password that I showed you earlier on it. It was NCT COG, all in caps, underscore 2018 with an exclamation. Um, before I log in, there's a help um, button here, and so you can always email us um, when you have issues with this website. Um, as soon as you email us, it notifies um, five to um, six people, and so we'll all be sure that we'll get back to you quickly um, to address your concerns. So I'm going to log in. And so once you log in, um, it pops up um, with the next phase, and, and so you can see from the top tabs, on this page, it begins to track my progress um, throughout this process. And so you begin to um, enter the information that you need. Um, let's say I'm from the city of um, Frisco. Um, I just pick my city, my community. Um, I'm a project engineer there. Um, and then I just begin to enter my name, my information, um, phone numbers. And so as you, as you, as you can see, um, it's tracking my progress and changing the percentages um, on the website. Um, within this website, um, we've already gone in to be able to collect all the information that we can for your communities. And so we've used a lot of sources like uh, FEMA, the state, um, the Census Bureau, and, be, and collect all the information we can. And so when you come in here, some of the information has already been pre-populated for you. And so what we need is for you to see whether they are correct and they need to be updated, or if you think they are okay, you just leave them as is. And so, for example, if we, you come here and you feel, oh, the population of Frisco is around 200,000 right now, you can go ahead and change that. And so this will be updated on the back end of the database. And so we are going to receive the updates. Um, and so you go through this and begin to um, change or update some of these um, numbers um, because you are the local people, you know what's going on within your jurisdiction. Um, and so as you go through it, you have any concerns at all about some of these um, 
and you are not sure of where we are getting the data from, um, just email us, give us a call, and we'll help. If you have additional comments, you can just put them here, and we'll pay attention to those comments and get back to you. And so I'm going to assume, for example, that you are done looking at this um, page. Um, you've entered all the information you can, and you are completed, and you are done. You can just hit save and continue. Or let's say you get a call, you have to attend a quick meeting. You can quickly just hit save. Everything will be saved. You're not going to lose anything that you've already entered on the web page. And you can always come back, re-log in, and all the data will be there for you. So I'm just going to hit save and continue, and I go to the um, okay, so right here it says, I said yes, I have a mitigation plan. It's asking me for the name of the plan. Uh, and so let's go, I'm just going to type in uh, Frisco Hazard Plan for now. So I can move to the next one. So I'm at a 60%. You look at the top here, it's changed to 60%. Um, and so here is where you begin to answer specific information about your community. Um, and so right here, it gives us sample answers about what we are asking for. So for example, do you have comments about the accuracy of the current flat plane mapping? If you say yes. Um, and so here's a sample answer. Maybe um, the maps were created on all topographic information. You have new LIDAR. So you feel that um, the mapping is it's going to change because you have new topographic information. So you say yes and say, hey, um, we have new LIDAR. Um, you can say the year, for example, we have 2017 LIDAR. Um, and mapping doesn't match topo. Um, and so you can go through these. Um, some of them might apply to your community, some might not apply, um, but we ask that you pay attention to the one that applies and give us as much information as you can. Um, so do you have, for example, master drainage plans? Um, you can, um, if it's under development, you can give us an idea of when it's going to be completed um, so that we can know that that's been um, developed. Um, do you have, for example, stormwater management plans? Um, do you have any um, structures um, that are not being shown in the current effective d Um That's a good set of information because that tells us that um, the mapping is not reflected on all the current development and we need to look at what's happening within that um, area of the flat plain. Um, do you have issues with dams, levees, um, things like that? Um, does the community have GIS? Because it helps us to understand how we can communicate geospatial information to you. Um, and so please, we ask that you go through these um, and let us know if you have questions, um, any challenges, and we'll be happy to assist you um, to be able to give us as much of the information as we need um, for this project. And so let's assume we are done with this and we want to move to the next phase again. You can hit other save if you have to be interrupted and you can always come back um, and finish this. Um, otherwise, you just hit save and continue. So at this point, um, I'm almost at an 80%. And so this phase is where you can actually go in, um, get a map pop-up, like most of the maps that we've seen at Google Maps, and then you can actually click on the map and begin to analyze, look at the flight plane information as is shown on the current um, FEMA maps in a digital format and begin to actually draw points or draw areas where you feel um, attention needs to be paid to um, as we do discovery within this watershed. Again, um, there are shortcuts here um, to look at some of the items that we want to collect. And so if you click on this, it gives you um, an idea, for example, when you are drawing a point that has a past claims hotspot, what is it? Um, and so it gives you a definition of what that is. Um, and so you want to go to the map, you can click on go to AOR map, and then it was going to launch the web map for you. Um, since I picked um, the city of Frisco, um, the map will launch um, on its page, and then it will zoom to my jurisdiction. And so what it's doing is um, it just looks at my community name, and then it's just going to zoom to um, where my jurisdiction is. And so right here, it's zoomed into um, an area in Frisco. And so this is the web map um, for the area. You can come in, just like most web maps that you all probably have worked with, um, you can pan and zoom um, by using your mouse. Um, you 
scroll with the mouse buttons. Um, you can also use these uh, buttons here to um, zoom in or zoom out. You can even come in here and change um, the base map source. So if you feel like you you are more you know used to looking at open street maps, um, you can change the um, base map type. So you can um, work with what you are familiar with. So one of the key things about using this map is um, there is a legend item here. Um, again, just like I, sh I showed you on the web page, um, these are most of the things that you'll be collected are related to this um, set of points that we call areas of mitigation interest points. Um, if you can also turn off and on um, some of the features on the map. And so, for example, if you feel like there are too many things showing on the map and you want to turn certain things off, you can come in here um, and turn, you know, stuff on and off within this area. For example, if I turn the AOMI points off, um, they are not going to be showing on the map. Um, so I'm going to minimize these for a while. Um, there's an address bar here where you can type in an address. So, for example, somebody calls you as a flood plain administrator within your jurisdiction, tells you any time it rains, it floods at this particular address in the street. You can just type that in and then go to that address, and then you can draw um, something on, on the map and then save it so we can catalog that information. And so I'm going to, to collect information on this map. You're going to hit the green button here called Start Editing. Um, and then it's going to pop up with the selections that I described as the areas of mitigation interest right here for you. Um, if you don't know what you want to collect, you can still draw and it will give you a drop down list on what. And then a comment box so you can type in comments about what you are drawing. So, for example, we want to assume um, anytime it rains, um, we have a lot of road overtopping along this area. We can come in here um, and then draw either a polygon or a point. So we can start with a point. Um, and so I want to draw an area, um, just a point there, so I'm just going to click and click on this. Um, if I didn't know what I wanted to point at, I can just draw it and then keep, um, pick from the drop-down list here. Um, so here I, I already pick um, the selection from the area of my points here, so it just selected that for me. Key emergency routes over top during flooding. You can add any comments you want to add about this. Um, you can say, for example, um, anytime um, it rains, um, this road over top. Um, and so this is going to help all the H&H &H people who will be working on this to pay attention to um, this area when they are doing the BLE data sets, just to see um, what happens um, um, when they do their H&H. &H. Um, um, do you have specific dates? If you have photos, you can add um, and give us that information too. So I'm going to click down. Um, you can go to other places, for example, and add more information, um, for example, um, there are new developments. Uh, let me turn on the satellite imagery. Um, and so all of a sudden, this place didn't have development, but now there's significant development. And so we know anytime there's new development, our uh, discharges increase. That might change the flows on some of the streams. Um, and so you can come in here again, um, draw a point, and say, this is a significant land use change in this area. Um, that you want us to pay attention to. So you can say new, for example, new subdivision created in 2015, as an example, and say that. Um, and so it's just going to draw that point for you. Um, you can delete points. Um, you can undo what you've already done. Um, you can select the points um, after you've created them um, to move them to another area. Um, and so these tools are here for you to just play with and be able to enter your information. Again, if you have challenges using the tool, um, you can um, just give us a call, touch base with us, and we'll help you out. Um, I also want to demonstrate how you draw a polygon. And so I just demonstrated points. So let's say all of a sudden you want to just say, this whole flat plane, you have issues with the flat plane. It doesn't match your topo. Um, you think it's, there are issues with it and it needs to be looked at in detail. So you can come in um, because you can't just draw a point um, to 
point out what you want to show us. You just want to be able to tell us the extent of um, the issues you have with the flat plane. And so you can just click on um, this general notes um, button here, and it pops up with this text to help you, guide you through the process. Just click to start drawing. So I'm just going to click, and then um, you just click to continue um, until you are done drawing your polygon. So I'm going to draw a polygon around the stream right here, and I'm going to double click to finish. Um, if you didn't draw it well and you have to delete, you can just delete it um, so it's not there, or um, you can redo it. And so if I hit this delete button right here, um, I've just deleted what I just drew. And so you can just redo it again um, to make sure you capture what you actually want to tell um, folks within this jurisdiction um, about your flood needs. And so once it's done, um, you can just click and say mapping in this area does not match current conditions. Please check something like that. And then you say done. Um, and so as soon as you you are done with collecting all your information, you can hit stop editing. Um, it saves um, all the information you've got it. And so you can see that's my polygon. That's my significant land use change that I drew. Um, I also drew the area that overtopped um, anytime it rains in this area. Um, and so once you've, and you don't have to collect all this within a day. Um, usually there are other people who have other concerns within your jurisdiction, so please make sure that you talk to them and you get all the information that you can, um, and then enter this on the website. Um, once you've finished um, collecting all the information, um, you can close it, um, come back to the um, page, and then check this box so that we know that you're actually done um, for your community um, collecting all the information. Um, and so once you check it as being done, you can see it's changed to 100% right here um, um, for you. Um, the next step is just to help us give you I uh, keep you informed about upcoming meetings re regarding um, discovery within this watershed. And so when we have dates for the fall meetings and other activities that might be planned um, for this project, we're going to put them on this page um, so you, we can keep you informed about activities within this watershed. Um, I haven't received any questions so far, so I'm going to hand over to uh, Mia to continue the presentation. All right, so uh, if you get on the website and you enter data, remember the password is right there. It's just nctcog underscore 2018 exclamation point and log in as your email address. If you do come up with any questions, please email us at the contact information you see here. As promised, it's displayed again. Again, my name is Mia Brown. I'm Environment and Development Planner at the Council of Governments that uh, works on this program. So please feel free to email me or Jared or Sam with any questions that you have. And since it doesn't look like we have any more today, I want to thank you for attending this webinar, and that concludes it. Have a good day.